Hello, and thank you for joining us for a panel on establishing experimentation as a core part of your project workflow. This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with Optimizely. The webinar will last approximately 45 minutes or so, after which both myself and the panelists will head over to the lead dev Slack to answer some of your questions in the building, hashtag building software channel. And during our chat, please feel free to post a question in the QA q and a widget within zoom we'll answer them towards the end of this panel if not we'll also answer questions within the slack channel so let's get started with some introductions i am lima nastri i'm an engineering manager at spotify where i work on personalization for the home page prior to joining spotify i led the engineering efforts for personalization a b testing at comcast and today i'll be joined with sha ma Shaw is the VP of Software Engineering at GitHub, where she is responsible for core platform and ecosystems. Prior to GitHub, Shaw was the VP of Engineering at SendGrid and was part of the leadership team that took the company public in 2017. Shaw cares passionately about diversity, equality, and inclusion, and in 2018 was named the winner of the Denver Business Journal's Outstanding Women in Business and Technology and Telecommunications. Shaw lives in Boulder, Colorado with her husband and two kiddos, and she enjoys skiing, sailing, and traveling with her family. Welcome, Shaw. Thanks, Lima. It was a very impressive bio. It's, it's like, not only are you savvy in technology, but also business. Um, so next, we have Robin, Robin Rapp. Robin is a data science manager and sociologist with over eight years of experience in data analytics. She leads a team of data scientists on the ranking and job search product at Indeed, in which they provide data-driven insights and machine learning solutions that help shape the world's number one job site. In her spare time, you can find Robin performing with her improv troupe, trying not to fall over in yoga class or playing video games with her cat, currently undefeated. Welcome, Robin. Thanks so much for having me, y'all. Is the cat undefeated or are you undefeated? <laughs> I purposefully left that vague. Oh, that's so funny. I was thinking it's very vague. That's funny. I'm going to go with you. Um, <laughs> and last but not least, we have Justina Wynn. Justina is a developer evangelist at Optimizely, where she fosters relationships with developers to help them leverage feature flags. I love feature flags. Um, and to understand the benefits of product experimentation. She's passionate about data visualization and pizza, occasionally both at the same time. Welcome, Justina. Thanks for having me, Luma. Is that like is the, here. is the data visualization in pizza a joke on pie charts or no? Oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna have to say that now when I do intros. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so let's jump into it. We all have business metrics that we're driving towards, whether it's revenue or engagement. The changes we make to our products are hopefully improving these numbers. Um, to this effect, how do we know we're actually improving these metrics as we make changes to our product? How do we know that the change is effective? How do we know we're not degrading the experience? Um, or from a machine learning perspective, how do we know that a change to an algorithm is not introducing bias in the predictions it's producing? So the answer to this is simple. It's experimentation. However, the implementation or establishing such a construct is not simple. Um, and what I'm saying here is if you're new to experimentation or if your organization is not yet accustomed to it, establishing experimentation is quite the effort. Um, and as someone who has worked on a platform where A-B testing wasn't necessarily really embraced, this is prior to Spotify, um, it was very hard pushing the need for experimentation further within the organization's culture. It's possible, but it definitely takes a lot of effort. Um, and you'd think, at least from my experience, that building the platform to facilitate A-B testing, tagging, tagging the accounts, creating the right test treatments, you think that would be the hard part, but actually sometimes convincing stakeholders that we should make use of these A-B tests to help inform our decisions. Um, first, making decisions based on our feelings, our intuition, um, was not that straightforward. So today, our objective for this panel is to discuss how to include experimentation into your workflow if it's not already included and answer questions that would give more insight into all the goodness that comes with adopting experimentation and making it a key tenant in your product engineering life cycle. So, our questions for the panelists are somewhat divided into three categories. Um, one, we have, if you don't have a platform, how do you get started? Then we jump into lessons learned from our experiences running, running experiments within our product areas. 
And then lastly, we have deeper cut questions for folks who are already who have already incorporated experimentations. So having said that, let's jump right into asking our panelists some questions. Okay, to get us started, what does experimentation mean to you all and your respective product areas or engineering organizations and how important is experiment experimentation to your team? What do y'all think? Gosh, that's such a good question. Um, so it's so central to everything that Indeed does. Um, Indeed, it ha one of our key values as an organization is that we're data driven. Mm -hmm. And experimentation is at the very core of that. And so with very few exceptions, any product feature that we introduce to job seekers or employers in the uh, job marketplace is tested in some capacity. And what is really striking about Indeed's data-driven culture is that that's not just within the product, that's also within organizational processes as well. We also have a, a culture of experimentation around, hey, we want to try this new way of doing, you know, quarterly evaluations. How are we going to test that, measure wow. it, and, and measure success? So that's super cool. That's, something that, that's awesome. That's something I've always taught, thought about when making changes that aren't product facing. How can we evaluate, like just for the organization, how do we evaluate it successful? Do we just make the, like reorgs, for example, like how do you evaluate a reorg is successful, you know? So that's cool that you guys incorporate it, um, not only within your product, but also within how you make changes in home. Yeah, and also um, at GitHub, uh, I think just like what you were saying earlier, Lima, um, it's not just the tooling and the implementation, but it's very much a culture and mindset. Um, yeah. So at GitHub, we kind of introduced this culture of experimentation, ship to learn mentality. Um, and we really think about uh, learning in three different ways. Um, so one is uh, talking to your customers through user experience research. Um, and then the second one is also from more of a qualitative perspective, um, you know, working with your super fans and a small set of your users uh, on launching a minimum viable product that's not available to everyone, but that you can iterate on top of. Um, and then finally, we actually leverage Optimizely for our data-driven experimentation. Um, so the first two involves just talking to your customers and really building that muscle mm -hmm. of asking specific questions and digging into the root of the jobs to be done or the problem that they're trying to solve. Um, and then setting up kind of a, a people process technology framework um, for running data-driven experimentation. Awesome, cool. So on that note, for our audience members who do not have an A-B testing platform, what do you think, or even like um, a platform like Optimizely to collect data, what do you think is the hardest part of introducing A-B testing within an organization? I can answer that to uh, kick things off. Um, at Optimizely and in general, our idea of uh, what we believe experimentation means is really delivering the right product uh, mm -hmm. to the user and also shipping it to them in the most frictionless way so that they're not seeing multiple like test treatments like you were saying. Um, and then to Shaw's point, starting out and trying to zoom in on what customer experience you can really refine and make better is really important. And you do that both with um, customer interviews as well as looking at the data that you have. Um, starting out with, if you don't have an A-B testing solution, um, kind of what we talked about in my introduction is, uh, and something that I focus on a lot, are feature flags. Um, and so at Optimizely, we really believe that feature flags are the foundation to A-B testing because I kind of see them as these levers that you pull. And once you're, um, if you're not familiar with feature flags, they give you the power to enable or disable features for a subset of your customers. So a lot of the times the customer, the prospects that I talk to who, you know, don't have any kind of solution to start with, they want, the, the first thing that they want to do is to be able to control their features in very granular ways. Um, and then after they start thinking about, okay, well, I can turn this feature on and off and I can target this audience or I can start rolling out features, then they start to think about iterations of those features. Um, and that's really where experimentation comes in. And so um, before you even think of any, you know, the requirements that you have 
for an A-B testing platform or what you're trying to do, thinking about how, how you currently build those features and how you deliver those features are super important. And then iterating on those features then enables you to think about, um, you know, the vendor that you want or, you know, are you going to build this in-house? Um, and those requirements will come along as you think about how you want to build and ship those features. Yeah, I totally agree with your feature flag. I think something to your feature flag comments. I think something to complement that is also like building a platform or using a platform that enables feature flags could also reduce risk. <laughs> and I think a lot of the reasons why folks don't buy into data driven decisions or running experiments is because they feel like there's some sort of risks with not going with the way that they're doing something today. You know, like change is hard and Use, hopefully like enabling feature flags can then make that change less hard. Robin, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think some of the challenges that I see, that I've seen in the past with, with teams, you know, who are, who are considering implementing A-B testing for the first time is, is usually some degree of skepticism around velocity. Hmm. So why should we test this yeah. when we can just ship it? Totally. Uh, and I would, I would gently push back on that <clears throat> because what I've seen in the past is folks shipping things, things break, you don't yeah. know why, you spend hours, weeks digging into mm -hmm. your past employees and potential bugs and telling yourself stories about what's happening. And, and so frankly, not A-B testing actually harms your velocity because your business health might deteriorate and you won't know why. Oh, well um, said. I think the other piece that I often see are some hesitancy around when implementing a new A-B testing culture um, is statistical literacy. So mm -hmm. there can be some apprehension here or, or worse, an overestimation of skills sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Some, some folks know just enough to be dangerous um, and, and will start telling themselves stories about what's going on in the data that might not actually be backed up by sound and rigorous statistical practice. So those to me, I think the, 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 the two pieces that have to do with creating a cultural shift and mentality to A-B testing are, are really crucial to overcome. Yeah, really well said. I really like what you said along the lines of if you're not A-B testing, you could be, I mean, you don't know the time that you're wasting on fixing bugs, like catching things earlier when it's like released to the entire audience, like nationally first, like incrementally to small groups. It's really well said. Yeah, and actually and then, to add on to that, I think there is um, an element of coordination in there. So I think another reason why companies are hesitant is that, you know, um, for example, GitHub, um, we went from about a thousand employees to now over 2000 employees in a really short amount of time, like a year and a half. And so if you look at all the teams and all the people working on features, um, I think there's a real concern about, hey, how do we make sure that there's not too many cooks in the kitchen or we're not step stepping over each other. And so because of that, we've actually set up um, an experimental council um, that is a cross-functional group of people coming together um, that meets on a weekly basis to actually coordinate um, what, you know, what experiments are currently running in production, who's getting, um, you know, different experiences, and how do we interpret that data. Um, and that's a group of people that, you know, um, comes from product, marketing, engineering, and we do have a data science team. Um, that helps, um, you know, uh, basically pair with different groups of people um, on each experiment to make sure that we're interpreting um, the data correctly and that there's uh, actionable outcomes coming out of the experiments. Yeah, we have something similar to that at Spotify. We call it the panel, but it, it consists of data scientists making sure that we're not interpreting, like not defining the best success metrics, having good guardrail metrics, making sure that it could be statistically significant, like we power up correctly, all of that good stuff. So I think that's really key because not everyone's going to know that. I mean, that's one I always I sometimes joke like in college, that's that's the one class looking back that I wish I spent more attention <laughs> in was statistics. Um, but luckily, I'm surrounded by wonderful data scientists that can help me with that. Um, so that was really interesting. Next question. Are there other tactics or tools folks could use that aren't yet able to implement online experimentation with real users? Thank you. 
I think Shaw had actually given a nod to this a little bit earlier, but I'm a big proponent of more qualitative user testing. Mm -hmm. um, a small sample might not necessarily generalize to a whole audience, but it can point you in the right direction towards issues or challenges that your users might be facing with mm -hmm. a given feature. And I'm a big proponent of qualitative data. Qualitative data is still data, mm -hmm. right? Can you well, use, go ahead. Can you use your employees as like a source for quality or are they power users or is there oh, bias gosh. there? That's a really great question. Um, I'm, I would say yes and no. I think that employees um, are coming from a perspective of constantly thinking about this product yeah. Yeah. And, and constantly thinking about, okay, I'm in this all the time. Or the guts um, of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They know the guts of it. And, and they also know the flow that things are supposed to happen in, right? Mm -hmm. But if you actually look at user behavior, you're, you're going to find thousands yeah. of different ways that people engage with your product that you could have never predicted. Mm -hmm. And I also am very cognizant of the fact that um, product technology engineering folks are not always representative of your users. Um, right. They may have stronger educational backgrounds. They might have different gender balances or race and ethnicity balances. Like, so, so that's something that when we do sampling, mm -hmm. even for qualitative studies, we think, all right, what is a trucker going to say about this? What is a nurse mm -hmm. practitioner going to say about this? Because we don't just help tech people get jobs. We help all people get jobs. Right. And so thinking through like, who are your actual users and, and what do they have to say about product changes can be a step towards getting data that you might not otherwise get if you don't have an experimentation platform. Um, What's actually really interesting, you said something about sampling. Not only do you apply similar methods of sampling users for like actual online A-B tests, but also when you do qualitative, you like make sure that you're sampling the right folks where there's no bias towards that. So that's cool. Yeah, and I think um, in general, it's good to just start building muscles in terms of talking to your customers and talking to your users um, on a regular cadence. And so sometimes like, you know, like little bits of information come out of those conversations that then can become um, your next MVP or your next um, feature experimentation. Um, so a good example uh, of something that happened recently at um, GitHub is the discussions feature. Um, and that came out of a conversation we had with the Next.js community. So um, an open source group um, who's looking to communicate with one another outside of just the ability to do that in issues, right? So um, it really came out of a very simple insight that as maintainers, um, you know, they really want to just get through. They're very task oriented and they want to get through issues as quickly as possible, but there's no other way for the community members to ask questions and interact with one another outside mm -hmm. of issues. And so by just that pure, um, you know, like insight, we were able to say, hey, what if we just, you know, put out something super simple, um, really right next to issues, um, you know, as a discussions tab and see if people start using that naturally, right? Mm -hmm. And then just over the course of, you know, several weeks really um, working with the maintainers of the next JS community to kind of refine that feature um, before we kind of then really just launched it to one community and you know test it out to see how it worked um, so you know don't be afraid to start small right but build the muscle of talking to your customers this is somewhat unrelated but not but one of the values of talking to your users is you got a product idea from it mm -hmm. yep absolutely okay. yeah. And the other thing I would add to that is oftentimes I see companies with like a customer research team or basically a team that's, they're the only ones dedicated to these customer interviews. But I find something that's been very powerful is having anyone who touches or builds that product. So from designers, engineering, marketing folks, sales folks, basically every, everyone being involved with customer interviews, I find to be very powerful when it comes to product feedback because they have a different lens as the way that they're uh, looking at it when they're building the product. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that their uh, input's really insightful and that the kinds of questions that they ask and what they can draw out from a customer outside from like the templated interview questions um, can be really powerful. No, that's real. That actually resonates a lot with me because in my prior life when I worked on personalization for video at Comcast, 
I was never involved in user research studies. And then that's something that's different at Spotify is I, I'm not I'm not asking the questions, but I'm listening and taking notes. And it's like fascinating to hear how the questions are asked. And then like folks is, and of course, like listening to music and podcasts is something that people enjoy. So it's just, it's, it's really cool to see their thoughts on how they use the product from like my perspective. It's cool being included in that. Yeah. And also, I think it's a good way of being reminded. I feel like oftentimes in tech, you're counting, you're, you know, you're looking at these analytics platforms yeah. and you're counting visitors or you're counting clicks, but it's oftentimes a really good reminder that there is someone behind those clicks and that there's someone behind using your actual product. And I feel like that gives you this level of empathy um, that's very different and very positive when you're working on the products. For sure. No, definitely. Um, so moving on from a convincing your leadership perspective, when you're lacking an experimentation platform, what tactics could you take to convince product or engineering leaders to invest in building a platform that would allow for more data informed decision making and things that I'm kind of thinking of here is like, should you do offline analysis, um, showing that like shipping a feature wasn't the right idea, um, things like that, that could help help folks that don't have an A-B testing platform or an experimentation platform help, you know, help leaders decide like, yes, you should go this route. Yeah, I think a lot of times you can think about it from a business case perspective. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes as a business, we need to just make strategic North Star bets. Um, and that recently happened at GitHub as well. Um, so we decided, you know, one of the things that we've always wanted to do is just be the home for all developers. And so we actually made um, all of, you know, uh, free private repos available uh, with unlimited collaborators for teams and, and things like that. And so we kind of um, changed our business model essentially from, you know, kind of a, a paid um, in order to kind of get on GitHub as a team to mm -hmm. completely like a freemium model and really just um, focused on differentiating features like, you know, action, CI, CD, and things like that. Um, and so because of that, it actually fundamentally changed um, how our business works, right, in terms of, um, you know, um, who's now making buying decisions and what are the metrics and how does this impact kind of the long-term sustainability of the business because of the business model change. And so we've actually now, um, it's, it's a bigger problem because, you know, our financial models that we've relied on, you know, previously um, are probably no longer as predictable, um, you know, now because, you know, we're working with a new set of assumptions. And so, um, so those are good times to say, hey, you know, we're taking a huge business um, bet or potential risk um, in just changing how our business works and kind of how we target and, you know, like this impacts the entire funnel of how people come to GitHub and how they sign up for GitHub and how they buy or make their buying decisions. Um, and so this is a good opportunity um, to introduce um, a more data-driven approach. Um, mm -hmm. So we can start like, you know, um, being more like focused on kind of each step um, of our uh, user funnel and figuring out if there is significant behavior changes, what are the main drop-off points, um, and if there are things that, you know, we're leaving on the table or people are not finding certain features or landing deeper into our experience. Yeah. yeah, Shaw, you had noted that something around taking taking a, a big bet, right? Something that I would think about when um, trying to convince leadership to implement a, an A-B testing platform, mm -hmm. whether that be first party or third party, would be to, to start with a test that you feel fairly confident is going to demonstrate a big win. Mm -hmm. Because you're able to then ex excite, very, it's very exciting to be able to come back and share yeah. like, hey, this made us you know, millions of dollars or, hey, this led to hundreds of thousands of people getting a job mm -hmm. as opposed to, hey, we tested this and it did nothing. Yeah. Right? So right. it can be a lot more if you are trying to get buy-in um, to build out an A-B testing platform, mm -hmm. start with a test that's fairly simple to implement yep. and that you expect will have a big, a big uh, payout. And you mm -hmm. can ideally find an executive advocate as well, who maybe has experience from other companies and has seen the value of A-B testing in those companies. Mm -hmm. You might even consider showing how other companies, especially yeah. competitors, have benefited from having an A-B testing research. platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Actually, that really resonated with me because like, I, I used to run 
or run the A-B testing platform and personalization in video at Comcast. And we would do small A-B tests that like slightly changed like the algorithm that was behind like one row. And that's not really captivating, like just one row. Um, but then we realized at a certain point, we have to stop doing these like incremental changes. Like we kind of need like a big win to show the value, which is kind of what you're alluding to as well. Um, but that actually leads me to my next question. You kind of hinted at it. So speaking of building platforms to facilitate A-B testing, there are third, pla third party platforms that, that enable A-B testing or experimentation like Optimizely. Um, how do you decide to go with an in-house experimentation platform versus third party? Um, I think it comes down to your core competencies and, um, you know, kind of uh, utilization of developer time, right? And so, you know, we already have to ruthlessly prioritize our features because there's so many different ideas um, and, you know, uh, product features that we want to implement. Um, and so the question is, do you want to spend a lot of effort kind of um, reinventing the wheel, essentially, in some of these areas? Um, building an in-house solution versus just saying, hey, you know what, like other people have figured it out and this is something that we can buy um, so that we can then focus on, you know, our own product features. Yep. Yep, I'll definitely echo to uh, Shah's point. I was actually speaking with um, one of our customers from Cox Automotive, Seth, he's the director of analytics there. and. The way that he said it was that um, he, you know, he wants his team to be able to focus on what they're working on and um, he wants to be able to find a company that focuses on what they're trying to make better. Um, and I thought their methodology for choosing whether to build in how or whether to continue going in house or go with a third party solution was very interesting in that they experimented with their experimentation uh, tooling. Oh, so yeah. what they did is, uh, yes, I thought this was super meta, but okay. they ran an experimentation with um, all the basically contenders that they had and they want to see which one would perform best. Um, and so they had a set of and they did basically set one day spike to be able to do this. And, um, and that's how they chose their experimentation platform, which was Optimizely. And I thought that was uh, a very also, it really speaks to their culture on how data driven they are and that they didn't just choose one based on price or choose one based on features or anything like that. So they really did put the, um, they really did start their experimentation program with an experimentation. Um, so I think that's a really good way to, you know, prove uh, that their tooling and that their requirements can in fact uh, meet their needs. So that's, that's one way to do it. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. I, think, I think that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, Shaw, you had noted something about, you know, what kind of knowledge do you have in house, right? Um, we're lucky at Indeed to have a lot of statisticians around. Um, and so you need to be really open and honest with yourself about the human capital that you have in your organization. Do you have folks who understand what a bond for correction is? Sampling schemes, statistical mm -hmm. power. Um, do we have folks who are bought into enabling payloads so that you're able to very quickly deploy and monitor um, your, your experimentation platform, right? So at Indeed, we actually have a first a set of first party tools that we've built out. And a lot of that too comes down to at our size and scale, you have to ask yeah. yourself what the cost is at, mm -hmm. at that point, because all of our PMs, all of our engineering staff, all of our designers, almost everyone has access to be able to look at testing results. And so being, being aware of cost, and so it's absolutely a trade-off between, between build versus buy in terms of how much dev time that you want to invest. The other piece we haven't touched on really yet is your data pipeline. So Indeed has um, an open source first party uh, data structure known as Imhotep, and it's, time, it's, time, it's a time sharded inverted index structure. Mm -hmm. And that means that it doesn't always play nicely with third party tools. And so it was crucial to us to be able to build something first party um, and be able to own, own that deployment and feature monitoring. So that makes sense. Yeah, I imagine cost customization, like ability to customize and definitely like play to your strengths. What does, how does your, organ, how is your organization composed of like data scientists, like you just said, I think plays a big role in deciding to go third party versus in-house. 
Um, so that was great. Jumping to our second portion of our questions, more of the lessons learned. Um, what was the most surprising test result from an experiment? An example of how assumptions can be very wrong, which showcases the need for experimentation is kind of what I'm looking for. I could talk about this for a really long time. So okay. I'm gonna limit myself as hard as I can. Uh, but the whole purpose of the scientific method is to be able to allow ourselves to be surprised and to challenge mm -hmm. our assumptions, right? Yeah. And so it's an integral part of writing a good hypothesis is writing it in such a way that you can be surprised. Mm -hmm. And so something that we've tested a lot in the D is our own assumptions from, hey, links should be blue versus black mm -hmm. on the internet or does site latency matter? How much does it matter? That's a great How, question. You know, right? And like, yeah. these are things that are just like core assumptions from like a design and engineering mm -hmm. perspective. And I would caution folks that just because other companies have found one result, you don't know that that's going to hold in your, in your context. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So we found, for instance, um, there's some really great research out of um, the Microsoft group on Bing around mm -hmm. the color of links and how it affected click through rates on their search mm -hmm. engine result page or their SERP. And people, they, they would say, oh, this, this really matters. Like just changing the color by a few hexes, mm -hmm. you know, is going to lead yeah. to millions of dollars of revenue. And you're like, well, let's do it. And so, and so we were doing a UX refresh. And uh, we were like, well, we should, we should test this because you yeah. had on the one hand, this compelling body of research saying that it would matter. And mm -hmm. then other PMs in the room saying, well, everyone knows that links are blue on the internet. And yeah. then the designers saying, are all you of these thoughts? like, yeah, like all these folks. And you're like, well, look, yeah. the only way we're going to know is if we actually test it. Mm -hmm. And so we did, and then we found it really didn't matter. So the oh, designers were like, can we please make our site look less garbage. <laughs> yeah. I love how you started this with like you like surprise instead of saying like wrong you said like be open to being surprised. I think that's like such a better positive mindset than saying words like you know it's okay to be wrong you know um, so I really like that. I also really appreciated how um, Robin talked about how everybody was involved and everyone had different thoughts. And I think that makes it um, even more exciting because people are looking forward to the experiment, experiment results. Um, and that's something that we do at Optimize it as well. Um, so I love being able to see that in other companies and their experimentation cultures. Yeah, and I, I think there's also certain elements to kind of what Robin is saying is that almost like, you know, you should celebrate some of these like failure scenarios or things that are not quite um, you know, working out based on your assumption, because that that's part of the experimental culture, right? And I think by just understanding something more deeply, like, um, you know, you had an initial assumption or a hypothesis, and mm -hmm. then the data showed otherwise, that's a learning opportunity. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, aren't you glad you didn't just go full on implementation mode and put that into production, yeah. right? And so I think those are all learning opportunities that should be celebrated. And I think that's really key to like, like an experimental culture is just being open to that. And just to add on to what Shaw just said, like in product development, you're so invested in the result. You want yeah. to see it win because mm -hmm. you've likely spent a ton of time and energy and thought into developing a feature. So you have a horse in the race. Mm -hmm. And that's actually kind of counter to the scientific method, right? The scientific method, you start with a null hypothesis that this does nothing. Mm -hmm. We don't think this does anything. Let's and see. you go from there, right? Mm -hmm. And so to Shaw's point, you have to almost change what winning means, right? It's not, oh, we're only going to call it a success if we see this move our metrics. Um, even if the experiment fails, you learn something. I love that. that. This makes me want to run like a bunch of A-B tests now. Like I'm not even saying it's just, and then like just the I, I really like the feeling of going the next day and checking what the results are. It's just, it feels like, like, like okay. Christmas. 
okay, don't don't peek at your results, please. Like, yeah, I knew I knew the minute I said that, I I had to like preface it with like you know I waited two weeks or whatever. But yeah, no, yeah. I agree. don't peek at your results. And just for folks in the audience, the because it's really hard not to, but it it increases the likelihood that you're going to see a statistical result just by chance. It's what's called a type one and error. So and we actually have an example of this happening at Indeed where like you yeah. can see like at different points where people mm -hmm. peaked and it turned out it had like, so just be very aware of that. No, it was a very good point. Good call, Robin. Um, so next question. Is there a different approach? I crowdsource this question actually. Is there a different approach with regards to evaluating changes if you're refining something that is definitely launching the users first a test to help decide if something is launch worthy at all. Should I repeat that question? Are you trying to figure out like, are you iterating on a new thing that already exists like, or are you? Well, it's more so like, you know, this is going to ship like, Versus like, oh, let's see, let's see if like users will like this. Like, is there a different approach? Do you take like, like, I can't come up with an example, but we can go, we can, we can pop, we can uh, say next. Let's go to the next question. This one's a little bit more easier. Um, are there different types of experiments or methods of experimentation? And we've alluded to this a bit. Yeah, I, I don't know if the, this kind of helps maybe answer both of those questions a little bit. Um, but one of the, you know, the ways that we prioritize kind of the focus for our experimental council is that there's actually two things we consider. One is um, uh, the type of experiment. So there, there are experiments that are kind of helping from a risk mitigation perspective, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of uh, really just de-risk a lot of your um, business assumptions and understanding what your customers and what the market wants. Um, and then there are things that have fairly strong signals um, through, you know, for example, just talking to your users, like kind of the um, discussions use case I provided earlier. And then it's really about um, maybe delivering, starting small, delivering limited functionality and iterating from there. And then so for the experimental council, like the data driven experiments, um, we focus a lot on like risk mitigation type of experiments versus like the more um, qualitative approaches that we've been taking around like user um, experience research, talking to the customers. Mm -hmm. Um, focusing on minimum viable product is more kind of around like, hey, you know, we have some really good, strong signals initially, and we just need to kind of iterate and get it to a state, um, you know, where, it, where it's uh, it's in a better shape. So I, I don't know if that kind of answers kind of your first question a little bit. Okay. And then I think in terms of some of the uh, like um, other approaches that we think about, um, you know, on the experimentation console is like, um, uh, correlation versus causation. Um, so a lot of times, um, you know, just because something happens and something else happens, um, it doesn't mean something caused something to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the type of experiments um, we try to focus on, like for our data-driven experiments, is more the kind of the causation type of experiments to say like, oh, because we added this link or, you know, we funneled the user this way that mm -hmm. is leading to like higher engagement versus just because this happens, this also happens. So those are, you know, kind of the two aspects that we focus on. Yeah. And I think maybe to your first question, Lima, mm -hmm. something that, that Shaw's comment kind of jogged for me just now is, is the concept of a do no harm experiment. So let's say that you've, you've, yeah strategically you've already decided we're going to launch yes. this product do we even need to a b test it and i would say yes yeah. i would say you still want to a b test it um and run it as like a do no harm experiment mm -hmm. uh, you might even if you have some Good you might even consider bayesian methods in that case just because p values don't necessarily work the same way when you're thinking about it from that approach mm -hmm. um but you know, the, yeah, the last thing that you'd want to do would be to introduce a new feature that you're like, yeah, this is going to work. And then it ends up breaking everything. And I've seen it happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you'd much rather have that happen to 1% or 5% of your right. users than 100% of your and users everyone. Yeah. all at once. Especially, I mean, so, you know, indeed, we help people get jobs. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. one of our core values is putting the job seeker first. And so we can't in good conscience ship something that we don't know what it does to somebody because it's not right. just, you know, clicking around, it's their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Like it, the, you not clicking on something might mean that you don't apply to a job, which means you don't hear back from an employer and mm -hmm. get a job. And mm -hmm. so for us to be able to just blindly ship something and not know what it does to the marketplace for job seekers or employers yeah. would be extremely irresponsible. So um, you might not necessarily have a similar kind of framing as you would for like a typical new feature, but you'd want to potentially think about guardrail metrics and set those ahead yeah. of time. So if we say, see, a 5% dip in this metric or that metric, we're going to pull the plug on this test and, and, mm -hmm. and rethink this, right? It actually leads me to a question that I want to make sure we have time for. And just because I think from both from GitHub and Indeed's perspective, just like GitHub has the users are different, they, like your products are different. So the question I have is how or what do you think about when choosing metrics for your AB test? I mean, like I have so many, I'm so curious, especially like for both GitHub and, and indeed, like, do you have a, for a GitHub, I'm going to just go on a rant on this just because I've been thinking about this for the past week for like GitHub, like you'd want active users continually come back, but for indeed, like you want them to get a job. So hopefully they don't come back, but I, I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So there are some company metrics that, you know, we tried to tie some of our experiments to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for example, when we went uh, with this freemium business model change, um, you know, we made assumptions like, hey, you know, if, um, basically we reduce the cost to zero, right? We should see more developer signups um, mm -hmm. and because, you know, teams can now have unlimited, you know, free repos and collaborators, then technically we should see more orgs creating private repos. Um, mm -hmm. And then this kind of ties to our you know, what we call like kind of our core um, fundamental metrics at GitHub and that then that should lead to more monthly contributors and, you know, more engaged users. Right. And so those are the assumptions that we start out with. Um, and then we kind of monitor over time to see if, um, you know, those are actually, you know, what's what's impacting user behavior and if those are the right assumptions. I think that the most successful teams and companies um, very much think like break it down how Shaw just did, which is like kind of with a gold tree instead of, um, you know, something I thought was really funny that Robin said was, you know, let's make this change and then it'll make us a million dollars. Sometimes uh, teams that are very, um, I, fi I find blinded by like the overarching, like we need to make the company money, like revenue being the primary goal. I find that very hard to tie back to the one experiment that people are working on. So being able to break it down using something like a gold tree um, to break down specific sub goals that they're trying to tie back to rather than just our main goal is revenue. Well, how, how exactly do you get to that? I think is the most important part to think through and tying that back to, you know, yes, you can tie that back to the company's main goals, but thinking about how your experiment plays into that, I think is really yeah, important. Like a tree. That makes total sense. Totally. Yeah. I think, having a hypothesis that's grounded in your understanding of of your users and ux research um i a mistake i often see folks make is um they're going to just go after their north star metric as justina noted and there might not actually be any grounding theory for why right so there's not really so for instance like if we change the color of this icon on our SERP, our search engine result page, mm -hmm. like it shouldn't really affect what an employer does. An employer is not going right. to even see that. So, mm -hmm. so, so maybe that metric might not be That's worth, true. you know, paying attention to for that particular test. Um, you know, look, there's no such thing as a perfect metric. Um, I think okay. it's, I think there's a, a famous quote by George Cox that like all models are wrong, but some are useful. It's the same thing with metrics, mm -hmm. um, human behavior, is so multifaceted that you can, you're never going to be able to distill it into one possible mm -hmm. metric, but you really, really should try. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so being able to go in eyes open about the caveats that your metric has, has the metric been validated before, right? You mm -hmm. usually don't want to introduce a new metric with a 
totally new test because you don't know okay. if what you're Good saying point. is due to the test or due to the metric being really weird. Yeah. Um, or like miscomputed or something. Yeah. Right. That's a good exactly. Point. Like what, how does it vary? What's the variance? Mm -hmm. um, does it have statistical power? Right. Are you not seeing a statistically significant result because there's no way for you to because you're looking for a needle in a haystack? Mm -hmm. Like Could you talk a little bit more like how do you know if it's statistically accurate? Sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a longer <laughs> like a question. <laughs> I mean, so when you say like, what is power in context? Yeah. Oh, that's a really great question. Yeah. yeah. So for folks who are un unfamiliar with power, the way I always like to explain it is like, let's say you're in a baseball stadium and you want to try and find a beach ball. <laughs> it's going to be a lot easier to find a beach ball than it's going to be to find a quarter. Right. And yeah, so, okay. and so statistical power is the concept of if there is a statistically significant difference between your treatment and your control, how mm -hmm. likely is it that you're going to be able to see it given the variance and the sample size that you have uh, yes. in your in your metric, right, and your feature change. So I, one of the things I always caution folks is be aware of underpowered tests because it's mm -hmm. possible that you could be missing something that's happening mm -hmm. because of, of the way that you're calculating statistical significance. Um, so, yeah, well yeah. said. Yeah, I always just rely on our data scientists for that, but that's it's really good to know a better understanding of what power means. All right, so I'm going to go with one more question just because we're at 1246. Um, what are the challenges of building a scientific culture? I, I I'll answer that. Too. Oh, go, go ahead, Justina. No, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, I think the things I see most in companies um, is, and even at Optimizely when we were first getting started, that center of excellence or that experimentation program is Estab yes, you establish all this methodology and the process, but actually getting people into the habit of doing it, I think, is the is one of the biggest challenges that people face. Um, yes, you can establish a center of excellence, but um, do you have an executive sponsor? Um, you know, is that your VP of product or is that your VP of data science or um, someone to really drive that motion and make it so that people are really thinking about, you know, feature flags or experimentation. Because mm -hmm. um, the other thing I see with companies is, you know, uh, yes, they buy Optimizely and then they're very excited to run all these A-B tests, but the actual motion to do it, I think is what, um, Oh, is so what's really challenging. It's what's like that? getting a gym member. That's so interesting. It's like getting a gym membership yeah. and never using it, but worse. Yeah. More expensive. Yes, exactly. And then, then we come in with teams and we say like, you know, this is the process. This is actually how you do it. And then usually we start out, um, we actually do lunch and learns with teams trying to, cool. you know, establish their experimentation culture by just thinking through exactly one customer experience that they can improve. And we walk through the entire, um, basically how you would prepare uh, uh, an experiment, how, the ideas that you have, the planning, who's gonna actually build, design and implement the experiment. Mm -hmm. So I think getting people, um, getting yeah. people, establishing the process is easy, but getting people to actually implement and use the process, I think is what I see um, as a hurdle. No, that makes total sense. And that's cool that you guys do that lunch and learn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was it's a lot of fun. Very, very similar. Um, you know, the hardest part is just getting started, I feel like, um, and kind of building the rhythm and the muscle around the whole um, kind of culture of experimentation, right? Um, so yeah, like we have an experimentation council, but how do people um, come up with ideas? What are the best ideas mm -hmm. um, that, you know, um, is fit for this process? So kind of doing a lot of lunch and learns about like, you know, um, the goal of this group and, you know, sharing ideas and the type of experiments that we run, um, you know, talking about kind of the different philosophies around qualitative and quantitative approaches um, mm -hmm. and in general, kind of building that muscle, right, whether it's the data driven side or just talking to your customers. Yeah, and to Justina's point too around the lunch and learns, I can't stress how important it is to just have a culture of of building that kind of quantitative literacy. So mm -hmm. at Indeed, we have built out a 
bunch of trainings around this because yeah, oftentimes cool. some of the challenges just kind of like, well, I don't know what power is. I don't know what statistical yeah. significance means. Like what's a P value? Like what is, what is all this? Like how do I sample effectively? And so even just building people's confidence because not everyone paid attention in their undergraduate statistics right. class, exactly. right? Yeah. <laughs> and so having folks who are good teachers and having ideally we actually had this led these trainings led by members of our data and product science mm -hmm. group and it's such a great way to kind of help explain to folks hey let's let's hold your hand like let's walk through this together mm -hmm. um and help build that skill um because it's so vital that people be that they feel empowered to really engage with with their tests and their results um, when they're building that that habit and that muscle um, yeah that makes total sense so before i close out is there anything we didn't cover that you all want to talk about the floor is yours um yeah just a quick comment i think um the best experiments that I run are always just super focused on like, you know, with specific questions or, you know, starting small, um, for example, like, you know, where are customers dropping off or like, what's the best way to call attention to a particular feature or something like that. Um, I think um, the thing to keep in mind is that um, experimentation isn't going to be your, you know, end all be all solution for product development, right? And so, um, you know, set the appropriate expectations in terms of um, what data driven experimentations can do for you um, and your company. Um, but don't expect it to be like, hey, the next big idea or the, you know, next business altering use case is going to come from, you know, something like the experimental platform. Yeah, definitely. Well said. Justine, did you have anything? I saw you went on mute. Yeah. I, yeah, I think the last thing that I'd leave a comment on is um, an expansion of what Shaw said about celebrating success. Um, at Optimizely, we send out, you know, weekly and monthly emails on all the experiments that are being run. Mm -hmm. So anytime someone launches an experiment, there's an email that's sent out to visible changes um, that highlights the hypothesis that highlights exactly where the experiment is taking in place and who's being affected by it. And then also we email out the results and we highlight um, uh, at our all hands, we do things like um, the experimenter of the month and we highlight the experiments that they run and the changes that they were able to affect. And I think that's a really cool and powerful way of saying like anybody could run an experiment and you can come to experiment weekly and um, submit an experimentation idea and people will help you design and build it. And I think just making it really accessible to everyone is important. What a fun environment. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I would just echo what, what Sean Justina has said, like start small. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. things, one of the challenges that I see regularly is folks try and cram too many changes into one t treatment group. And the challenge with that is then you start seeing all your metrics doing weird stuff and you've actually, mm -hmm. actually made it harder on yourself to reap the benefit of A-B testing. The whole point of running a randomized control experiment is mm -hmm. that you can isolate this one thing that we changed is why we're seeing the metric change that we did. But the more levers you start pulling, the harder it is to actually measure what it is that you did. And it can actually just lead to more confusion and mm -hmm. storytelling as opposed to um, making sound scientific conclusions based off of the experiment that you ran. So there's lots of work and research papers done on if you're going to pull multiple levers at once, things like multivariate testing and multi-armed bandits might be a, a, a good tool for that. But my general advice is, is keep it simple. Mm. Yeah, that makes total sense. Well, with that, I think we can wrap it up. Um, I did want to say thank you so much for all the good, good insights in today's panel. It was really interesting. I found it really interesting. Um, I think we can safely say it's well worth it to include experimentation in your product development life cycle. We'll be taking questions now on the lead dev Slack in building software in the hashtag building software channel. Um, so for the audience, please head over to continue discussion and we'll be there too. 
And to finally say, I'd like to say good luck to everyone who may be inspired to be a catalyst for change by introducing experimentation into their organization and to those that are already running experiments, as my mom says, keep up the good work. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank